this. Got it. Recording in progress. All right. All right. Internets, welcome back to another Sultans and Sneakers episode with Robert Dufour here and Omar Lee. I'm your host, Maheen, the podcaster. It's been a while since we've done a Facebook live stream. I, I think that last time we did a live stream was that debacle of a debate I, I hosted with uh, these uh, this Pentecostal preacher and uh, my friend Ijaz Ahmed from Toronto. They talk about an abortion, <laughs> you know, about a debate just gone wrong. But uh, yeah, so how, how y'all how y'all doing? First of all, I apologize for delaying the show by a week. Um, I broke my internet last week moving my computer around and whatnot. So, what, 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 what's the good word in uh Texas, Omar? Other than like Texas still sucks. Uh, well, Texas still sucks, but every day I can dream of visiting Omedunya, St. Louis, and being back <laughs> in my hometown. And uh, I just bought tickets to the wrestling world team trials in that great tourist destination of Lincoln, Nebraska mm. next month. So I can look forward to that. And Rob, I want let me let me ask you this. What's your um what's new up in Windsor? Like, I mean, as Canada kind of like normalized a little bit with COVID-19. Uh, I haven't heard anything in the news lately. A little but- bit. A little, a little bit. bit. I mean, they've opened up some of the restaurants, uh, but the, for the most part, Canada has been much more careful with, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 protocol. Um, so London is not too bad because, um, you know, it's not an international city like Windsor uh, where you have people going across the border, even people who are working. Um, because, you know, there's been a, bad, a lot of bad outbreaks in Windsor. And then, of course, Toronto is an international city. Um, you know, but London is kind of sandwiched right in the middle. So, um, our COVID situation, uh, hasn't been nearly as bad. So, okay, cool. Yeah, well, and, al- and also, also here in Texas, um, governor Abbott and, and the Republicans, and this is a conservative right wing state with that has had a very negative effect on the history of America, not just current political situation. Uh, they have been very irresponsible in their handling of COVID as has the state of Missouri and, um, Governor Parson, but the city of St. Louis, Mayor Tashar Jones and County Executive Sam Page uh, have been great. So it really just kind of depends on where you're living and where you're at. Uh, cool, cool. Um, so we're going to get into like the meat of the topic a little bit. I want to kind of get the icebreaker because this might get a little heated <laughs> in a little bit. But uh, to start, um, both of y'all are NFL fans of the NFL. I want to get y'all's um, predictions for the upcoming season, uh, Super Bowl picks and what would be your uh, surprise? Is there is there something that's going to happen that's a surprise for any for anything? So I'll, I'll let uh, Rob go first. Rob is a Browns fan. Yeah, I don't know how I, you became a. Actually, can, how did you become a Browns fan? By the way, uh, 1999. It was their um, the season where they came back uh, after they moved to Baltimore, and I had never yeah. heard of the Browns. Uh, I think it was, what was I, 18 years old. Um, so I turned on the TV and there was a, it was their last game of the season. They were two and 13. Um, and the whole, the whole stadium was absolutely packed and they were going nuts because they were beating the Colts. Uh, so I just like, what is this team? I mean, this is way better than the lions. I mean, <clears throat> there, I heard some guys scream, yeah, we're two and 13 and we know it baby. And uh, <laughs> that just sums up why I'm a Browns fan because they have the best fans in the world. And now we actually have a good team. So my, Super Bowl prediction is that uh, the Cleveland Browns will face uh, the uh, Los Angeles Rams uh, in the Super Bowl. That's my prediction. You're, you're, already, you're already in a bad foot with Omar, man. You picked the Rams? Ah. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, <laughs> okay, the St. Louis Rams. Oh, and, yeah, that's oh, right. They're not and, there anymore. And, and then, oh, so, Rob, what's your – what's your uh, any surprises that we'll expect in the season? Uh, in general, yeah. um, I, I'd say the Lions, well, it's not going to be, be a surprise, but I, I say the Lions are going to win four games this season okay, or, or fewer. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So my prediction is, and first of all, I don't have a team. You know, I used to be a St. Louis Cardinals baseball and football fan. Mm. And then the Big Red, the football Cardinals moved uh, to Arizona. So then we were left without a team. And then we got the Rams. We got our Super Bowl. We got the greatest show on turf out of the Rams. You know, Kurt Warner, Isaac Bruce, Marshall Falk, Tory Holt, Isaac Keem. We sent them on their way to L.A. So now I only have two rooting interests in NFL. I root against the Rams, and I root against the Cowboys. What do I think will happen with the Super Bowl this year? 
Uh, I predict, I actually agree with you that Cleveland would be in the Super Bowl. Um, you know, I think they're looking strong. Uh, and I think that they will play the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, I believe Tampa is, I mean, they re-signed every starter from last year. They have more cohesion. They were playing lights out at the end of the year. They've added some free agents. I believe uh, it'll be a Tampa Bay, uh, Cleveland, Brown uh, wow. Super Bowl. This, and, is the and only I, thing, this is the only thing we're going to agree on the whole show. Exactly. <laughs> and Tampa, and actually, you think Tampa Bay wins? I think Tampa Bay wins. But by the way, I I, I – I love what, like I love the state of Florida more so Miami, and we all know why. And uh, uh, I mean, he knows why definitely. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cleveland, I actually like Cleveland. It's a similar city to St. Louis, you know, Midwestern industrial city uh, that's seen some hard times and trying to bounce back. Uh, surprise of the NFL season, um, you know, I think the Chiefs are not going to be as good. Uh, it, I think the, I think the Redskins or the the Washington football team is going to be better than a lot of people think. I think they may make a deep run in the playoffs. And I think Kansas City is going to be worse uh, than a lot of people think. And I think they'll maybe just barely slide in the playoffs. Okay, cool. Um, I don't really have – I don't make predictions like this. I'm a 49ers fan. Um, I'm more interested in seeing – and living in Chicago, the things I'm most interested in seeing is the development of Justin Fields and the development of Trey Lance. And um, you trying to see if they – well, actually, I, I think Justin Fields will be starting by like week two or week mm. three. Uh, you know, um, Lance, also, I don't England, know. Sorry, New England will be. Also, I think New England will be in the playoffs. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my thing. I don't know how the Niners are going to do. I mean, a lot of people think this is a bounce back year for the Niners. They got the injury bug last year. I guess if I had to pick, um, I don't know, Browns and Niners Super Bowl. <laughs> Oh, I hope <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> that's not the it's not the weakest division, Maheen. That division is so difficult. <laughs> so you know, but uh, yeah, I don't mean, put no money on that. <laughs> I think the Cardinals have a better shot than uh, the 49ers. Yeah, that's so. my prediction. The for, the Cardinals have a better record than the 49ers in that. Division. Okay, cool. Okay. All right, and then w w what do y'all thoughts about the Taliban? Y'all y'all celebrating or what? <laughs> well, was pretty, oh, that was a pretty blunt question man. You know what I'm uh, before that let me give you all a little trivia sure. uh, in, in St. Louis one of the most lethal street gangs is known as the downtown Taliban they're oh, not Muslims, Muslims. Oh, they're, they're not, not Muslims, Muslims. This, they like the name um, you know let's, let's take it back a little history with the Taliban if you remember in the 90s they had a spokesman who got an Ivy League scholarship. I forget what Ivy League school he was at, but he was at one of the Ivy League schools. And he actually toured the country with a couple of known MT personalities, whose name I won't mention because I won't get anybody in trouble. It, but, was, it wasn't Daniel, was it, Omar? No, it was not Daniel. <laughs> but, in the 90s, Daniel was like probably in middle school or something. But yeah, maybe one of Daniel's neighbors. That's your, <laughs> that's your only clue. So anyway, <laughs> so, so anyway, the... the, the um, you know, I would say there was not major support in the U.S. Uh, for the Taliban pre-9-11, but there was some, like, small pockets of support. A lot of people were turned off by the treatment of women, et, et, et cetera, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, right. What do I think now? I think, uh, basically, I think Joe Biden did the right thing. Um, 20 years is enough. How many palaces are we going to build? Abdul Rashid Dostum. Uh, how many countless billions did Afghan war warlords and politicians steal? I mean, uh, cars I talked about, wheelbarrows of cash, uh, Ghani uh, planes full of cash. Uh, we see the children of the Afghan elite living in luxury housing in New York and in, in, in Northern Virginia. So uh, I think it was time to pull out. You know, uh, we should have never occupied Afghanistan in the first place. I mean, a limited response to uh, bin Laden. Yes, I understand that. But an occupation of a whole co a country uh, didn't make any sense. So I'm very proud that we're gone. And the bottom line is um, um, if they did not want the Taliban to take over the country, they had the opportunity. They were given billions of dollars in weaponry. They could have fought. They could have stood. They could have defeated the Taliban with all the weaponry given. They did not have the will and determination to fight and to, to win. And history is made by hard men 
who are willing to die and kill for what they believe in. And the Taliban are willing to die and kill for what they believe in. And the other side is not. And uh, I see Masood Jr. in the Washington Post begging uh, United States for more money. Cut them off. The only people that are upset about the U.S. leaving Afghanistan are some people in Afghanistan and the, um, the military industrial complex and their inside the Beltway supporters. So I, I'm very happy with what's going on. Uh, we hope this is a kinder, gentler Talibanism, uh, uh, tender Talibanism, as they can say, and let's let the girls go to school. Uh, let's engage them as an international community, and let's try to get them to be more inclusive and include other actors uh, and uh, make this tender Talibanism. Tender Talibanism. I mean, I mean. Yeah, I can. I, I have nothing to add about that, Mahina. You know, I, I uh, second what I, everything that Omar said, one hundred percent. You know, I'm just, I'm glad they're out, and uh, you know, um, make dua that uh, you know this, you know, that the the people of Afghanistan, uh, you know, live in peace and safety and security and uh, and prosperity. And you know, we saw the interview with uh, the one I, the one uh, members of the Taliban saying that uh, you know, like the again, it's it's. Burqa is not uh, obligatory. Again, I, I assume that they're, you know, like um, uh, learning more about uh, Islam and, you know, like uh, from from the, from the scholars, from the Ahl Sunnah, mm. and not just some, you know, like just, just going off. They're uh, Diobundis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't think, yeah. But like, I, I want to say that. So I, I want to, I was telling Omar before he got on, Rob, we were like off the, off the record. So the Talib, so I have a, the last Facebook live stream I did, I, I mentioned earlier that the last time was a train wreck debate between uh, a, a, a Pentecostal preacher locally in Chicago and uh, Ijaz Ahmed from Toronto. We did a Zoom stream, etc. But, you know, this pre this pastor and I, we have a pretty, I, we, I would say we have a decent relationship, pretty good relationship. We met a few times for lunch. So he invited me to lunch today. He wanted to ask, he had some questions about the Taliban. So he messaged me on Facebook and then we went for sushi. There, I went on my, met him on my lunch break. And, um, you know, he paid, so that's, that's always a win. And he, uh, he asked me about like, so first he was like, so Mahin, what school of thought are you? And I was like, well, I, I follow the Maliki school. He's like, okay. And then there, you know, I was explaining to him the deal, but he's like, so is there a difference of opinion amongst like apostasy laws amongst the different like schools? I'm like, the hell do I care? I don't live in an Islamic state. It don't matter to me. Like I, I, I only study stuff that's relevant to me. Right. And then he was just like, okay, okay. And then he was like, and then somewhere or another, we got to the point of like, so I, I'm hearing this talk because he's he made a, he gave a, um, he was preaching about the Taliban and his sermon. I'm like, bro, why do you care about the Taliban? They're another country. He's like, how many Christians are in, in, the Tal in, in Afghanistan, man? He's like, very few. He's like, so uh, what's going on with them? Are they being like sold off as sex slaves or something? Like, what's going on? <laughs> right? And he's like. I don't know. I, we, we, I got some context on the ground there. We got, we got. I don't know yet. I'm like, listen, if the Christians are cool, like, listen, here's the thing. Cause he was asking about like the rules of da Dawah and stuff and you know, what Christians can do. I'm like, listen, man, they're 1% of the population. They're not, I don't even know if they're 1%. They're 99.8% of Afghanistan is Muslim. 90% Sunni, 10% Shia. You probably got like whatever. I don't know, uh, maybe a couple hundred of some other religion. I don't know what the, what the debt, what the breakdown is. Right. I'm like, listen, the way I look at it is if, if there's a church there, the Taliban shall let them worship in their church. If the church breaks down somehow, they should support it, right? But the Taliban definitely should be letting no missionaries up in that joint. And he's like, you feel that? I'm like, hell yeah. Leave them alone, man. They're in their country letting their own thing. You got your, you got your own problems. You, you worry, you're worried about your own American society that's deteriorating, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of what I was telling him. But then he was like, so what's this I hear about like sex trafficking and stuff? I'm like, what do you mean? Like, Explain to me by sex trafficking. He's like, well, when, when there's spoils of war and you have like women and children left over, I'm like, well, and, and you know what he's been happening? He's been reading Jonathan Brown's book. That's really? what happened. But, but anyways, let me, I'll, I'll tell you what my response. Like, it, I probably shocked him with his, my response. So he's like, I'm like, okay, so you've got like, let's say you do some war and you've got like ch women and children. What, what are you gonna do? You you you. You want to kill them? You don't got prisons. You want to throw them in prisons? The, what's, you don't have women just living by themselves in the middle of tribes? That ain't going to fly, dude. Right? Yeah. So you marry them off. He's like, you marry off the jihadi? I'm like, sure. I'm like, right. why not? I mean, jihadi's a good word for me. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, whatever. We're, ta we're talking about it historically, you know, the, again, the, the, 
it was a different time back then. Yeah, uh, but he, but I guess he had contracts yeah, with. You know, the, yeah, the yeah but I was but I was I talking mean, about yeah. So he was telling he me like through the contracts. True, but he 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 was telling me about like you know generally speaking conceptually I got no issue with it right. If these women, there's no prison. You don't throw them in some prison. They're obviously living in their land. They get protection. And if they're being like getting married, and it's not like they're being forced. You know, that's the thing. Well, the spin is to, like to me, this, this, that, that's all. You know, th this is why I go back to the Jonathan Brown thing. Is this is just historical arguments? Like uh, these things are not applicable to modern times. So Did you read his say? book in full, about Omar? I read his book in full. Slavery. No, no, no. no. I wasn't really interested. In it. I mean, I get the gist <laughs> of it. You have to. But, read, you can't critique yeah. it unless you read it in full. But what I'm saying is, is those are things not applicable to our modern times. We have international law but and things like that. It's important to understand them. Norms. Yeah. Well, if let me you, if let you me don't understand guys, the past. But, are you supposed to argue again? Well, well, hold on a second. It's, 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 what I do understand is this: is you can study things in history, but to study things in history and say that um, what was moral and ethical a thousand years ago is moral and ethical a thousand years from now. Any, Soci yeah. Societal norms change yeah and, and 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 so and so if 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 you say okay they plaque practice slavery then okay but what he has said is you cannot say slavery is immoral uh you cannot say uh you have to read the book sex no, 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 no 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 i'm not talking about the book i'm talking about what he said you know what i'm saying what you the said. lecture that you went to so yeah, but, 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 yeah. but I, i'm digressing a little bit so i yeah. guess the guy's point was that his understanding is that the taliban have like some kind of like booties of war i don't know if that's real or not i don't know if that's true i told him like in the western I don't media think that's true i don't, I don't think listen to anything true. but i was like hypothetically yeah. speaking I, I was like let's 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 be hypothetical about it conceptually right. speaking let's say the taliban they are in some war and there's women and children who are like and and so he's like like tell i think he was like actually he's like mahin so let's say you're in afghanistan and your daughter is un and they're like it's only unmarried women they're not taking married women your 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 da unmarried daughter she's 15 now she's like now like you know captive or something i'm like okay and then she and and she's are you we open her to marrying one of the one of the soldiers i'm like at a high level i don't what's the problem like y'all 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 kaffir chicks here are like people are like they're like sleeping around at 15 right so i'm like i don't get it he's like he looks me in the eyes like are you sure I was like you, you're dead now. I'm like, yeah. I mean, listen, like it's a Jerry, it's a very generic kind of, like, like generally speaking. I was like, the devil's in the details, right? You know, if if there's a marriage, you assume that there's marital rights being fulfilled, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's not the spin of forced marriage. You're I wouldn't doing, assume that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you because, yeah. it, but it's all the framing, right? It's all yeah. the framing, but because we're we're talking about a hypothetical argument here. So I'm gonna be like, okay, then we go by the general definition. So it's important to it's important to study the past because a lot of people who the anti-Islam, yeah. whether it's from the the right or from the new atheists, uh, or from postmodernists, yeah. you know, they're gonna bring up these historical arguments as evidences. But people, anyone who has even a minor in history, yeah. knows that uh, you know there was a different time, a different place. Uh, the same thing with young marriage. I mean. Every society in, in pre-modern society married young because you lived in a tribe. And if you didn't, your tribe depended on the fact that you need to have a workforce and people and people giving birth at high rates. I mean, the infant mortality was high. Uh, the death, you know, the death rate was, I mean, life expectancy was low. Um, and there's no way that any tribe would have survived if they had all had waited till 18 yeah, I, or 25. I mean, it's impossible, but you have to, but again, we're living in a different time now. And fifth, exactly. So I agree with that studying history from that perspective. What I don't agree with is studying history and saying, oh, this was a much better time. People were much more moral. They were much better Muslims. So let's go and get my 12 year old daughter in Atlanta or oh, Chicago agree. married. You know, that's, that's where I come to. Yeah, and I, I know people that have done that, by the way. You know, and you know, so that's I, where. And, and and I'm not saying that like it's the ideal either. Like when he was a question to me, I was like, "Listen, you're you're in the context of the war, etc. She's 15. She has no one to protect her. You know, then like marriage to whoever is is you know yeah, is. But is this a, is where this is coming from. Look, he 
the conservatives in America, the conservative Christians are now being bombarded with all this, you know, Christians are being slaughtered in Afghanistan and all these fake news. Um, so they have a lot of conspiracy spreading about yeah. exactly what is going on in Afghanistan. Now keep in mind, they mostly have a nonsensical position. Number one, we shouldn't have pulled out when many of the same people just last year were agreeing with Trump's plan to pull out. So what's the difference? Huh. And then third, mm. they're saying we've sold out the Afghans, but don't take Afghan refugees. So what is it? They have a pretty incoherent uh, position on that side of the aisle. Right, right. Exactly. So cool. All right. Well, people didn't tune in to listen to the NFL or Taliban talk. The Taliban huh. podcast was last week on Mad Mom Books, by the way. So we're scrapping the yeah. icebreaker questions, man? No, we're, we're, we're moving on to why people are here. Okay, so... Okay. Um, the reason we are here is that uh, like, about a few weeks ago, Omar had a YouTube video. I think you actually removed it, but it was about um, arguing for white why white people shouldn't convert to Islam. Now, it's Correct. not as cut and dry as just like no whites, because obviously you're a white dude who yeah. converted to Islam, right? Correct. Rob is yes. a white dude who converted to Islam, right? Yes. Um, yes. Maybe some, there's some nuance in it, but it's a nice Rob's got a little more color, actually. <laughs> I have it's an a, Armenian admixture. When you know, ah, okay. it's, a, yeah. it, it's a nice little clickbait title. And you've actually posted about that before on yes. Facebook a few years back. Yes. Um, so just to start off, and um, I know we have a list of questions that you guys both came up with. Um, I don't know if you want me to like read off the questions first. I think that would be no, – we, we can make – I think we should make our preamble, both of our introductions to okay. the base of our argument, and then you could come with the questions that, that – both myself and, and then Rob we'll kind of go back later. and forth i'll ask maybe i'll ask because rob's got a set of questions i'll ask yes. rob's question omar you answer and then you can have a dialogue on that and then we'll move to the next question does that sound cool rather than That's lump cool. them all together in the beginning people yeah. are going to forget so exactly yeah. all right okay so o o o o omar it's all yours what is your uh what's the premise like these, these videos these posts talking about white people not converting to islam what, what is actually uh what do you mean by this okay to proceed this is the basic crux of my argument. Uh, in the early centuries and generations of Islam, it was not easy to convert. When they say we must follow our salaf salaf, you know, the, the earlier generations or that each generation coming uh, is, is less in deen. In the early generations, it was difficult to convert to Islam. Uh, and I'm specifically talking about the Umayyad period. Uh, during the Umayyad period that it was very difficult for non-Arabs to convert because they wanted the jizya, right? It was not economically in the best interest of the Muslim ummah for people uh, to convert. Uh, Islam was primarily seen as, as an Arab thing at the time. Uh, and the, the Islamic conquest, conquests we know as now were primarily seen as Arab conquest. So in order to convert to Islam, you had to be sponsored. Uh, you had to be adopted by a tribe and you had to be accepted and taken in. Now, I think this is a good model, um, something from history that we can use, a good model that we can go back to. And why do I say this? Because particularly in the United States of America with the white community, we have seen an endless parade of mentally ill people convert, disingenuous people convert, uh, we have seen political extremists convert, and now even white supremacists convert. We know that most of the people that convert to Islam do not stay Muslim because there is nothing for them. Masters don't have convert care. And even when they do, you know, they're, they're well-intentioned, but they don't necessarily know uh, what people need. I think it's very difficult to survive as a Muslim without an extended Muslim family. Uh, this is why the African-American Muslims in previous generations in the 60s and 70s created jamaats with the Dal Islam, Islamic Party, et cetera, because there was this understanding that you needed a tribe, you needed an extended family. So I think two things. Number one, we can go to a Umayyad model where you have to be sponsored and accepted to, to convert. And then you come in via a family via a community. So if you come in with a Diobandi family, you come in as a Diobandi and you've been a, a, adopted uh, in, into that way of thinking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you can be a supporter. 
because we know that there's not going to be any mass conversions of white people to Islam. For 1,400 years, white civilization has been an almost, and we, when I say white, I'm, I'm talking about Western Europe, Central Europe, et cetera. We know that there are white uh, skinned Muslims, but Muslims had, white Muslims, I mean, white people have been in basic um, um, state of warfare with Muslims and Islam. And the small, tiny number of people that convert to Islam in America, a high percentage of them being mentally ill, cultural appropriators, and all other kind of oddballs. This is not going to uh, achieve what Salahuddin did not achieve and what the Ottomans uh, didn't achieve. So that's not going to change. So when white people become Muslim, you are you need to integrate into a non-white community, get in where you fit in, and be of benefit. And I don't think there's anything wrong with people saying, hey, not of benefit. Uh, you, you don't seem balanced. You don't seem like you got a good head on your shoulders. Uh, you're of no use to us. Also, I think that the ulama don't understand the social, uh, the sociology of our time. You know, we had a celebrity imam a few years ago talk about the five minute shahada or the 10 minute shahada. Okay, how many of those people actually stayed Muslim? Not many. So I think it should take one year to convert. And a model we can use is, is the model of Orthodox Jews, where it takes one to two years to convert. And then you have to go forward to a religious court, a panel of three judges to accept your conversion to make sure that the convert is sincere. We have people converting today so they can get a better seat at the Free Palestine rally. We got people converting today so that they can be, so they can gain a couple of interse intersections within progressive politics. Um, that's not genuine. As I've said, the best white converts seem to be the people that come in through marriage. Why? Because they're marrying into a Muslim family that is helping them with the holidays, is helping them with Ramadan, and it's very similar to the to the Umayyad path of adoption, which I previously mentioned. Uh, Robert, any thoughts? Okay, uh, so I'm gonna yeah give my preamble. So um, what Omar is stating has absolutely no basis in any Islamic orthodoxy whatsoever. Um, the we take our um, Sharia from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam, and the first gen three generations. And the overwhelming consensus of the scholars is that um, it, is, it is completely haram to blockade anyone from converting to Islam or discourage anyone from converting to Islam. Um, it is... It has no basis whatsoever in Orthodox uh, Islam. And that's exactly, and again, that's what Omar stated in his video. Uh, so again, we, so we were not going to sit around and argue this from a standpoint of Islamic Orthodoxy, but I think, you know, everyone is in agreement. And again, you know, he couldn't even get, even though Omar has almost 4,000 subscribers, he couldn't even get six people to like his video. The overwhelming majority dislike the video. And he, those are his followers. Um, so, you know, and what he's suggesting is just going to perpetuate the same problems that he's talking about. Um, the reason why, you know, white people don't join a, a Muslim community, he put his finger on it. And again, no one is, he's really good at diagnosing uh, why the vehicle is broken down. Um, you know, he's better at it, I would say, than I am. I mean, he's, you know, he understands uh, the, socio the sociological realities um, of why white people why you don't see them converting to Islam. Um, but again, the, the big difference between Umar and me is that, you know, we have a very simple, easy, feasible solution to get the car back on the road um, so we can improve the status of Islam in the West. Um, and again, the, I, we have a lot of overwhelming support uh, from Muslims from all walks of life. So um, Dalia Mogahed uh, and Hassan uh, um, from the, uh, for IS, the ISPU uh, did a show a few months ago on the Mad Mam Lukes. And they said every time that they do a poll uh, for the Muslim community, 20%, uh, uh, and this is just a general poll, you know, it's, it's a general poll just of Muslims in, 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 in the United States, 20% identify as white. And, and, they, and this is not a fluke. Every time after time after they do this, uh, you know, they're, they're there. Uh, but the thing is, uh, 
you know, they're, they don't belong to an Islamic ecosystem. So um, the mosques, like Omar said, they don't have the time, they don't have the money, they don't have the resources or the wherewithal to, you know, support these, uh, to support these, these white converts. Um, and when they do it just, it, th those efforts just fall flat on their spaces because you're forcing people into an, a completely unnatural situation. And the reason why you only see, uh, you know, the extremist uh, white convert or the, uh, the extreme protester or the, the white convert who wants to join ISIS is for two reasons. One is because, again, when they're seen on the media, uh, they get, you know, an incredible amount of attention. And this is what we call in psychology heuristics. You only see what is available. And from that, you base your opinions on this is what the majority of converts like. There are many people, many white people who convert to Islam. They take their shahad in the mosque. You just don't see them anymore uh, because, you know, they're just living their lives. And a lot of Muslims don't even go to the mosque. Uh, they just go for Eid prayer and Juma prayer. And that's about it. Um, so, again, the, the solution is very simple. Uh, you know, the whenever the Muslim community has taken a communitarian approach, in which they allow the, the people from that, the non-Muslims from that region who are converting to keep the good things in their culture, collectivize uh, as a group, um, and just basically filter out the things that are haram uh, in Islam, um, then that has worked beautifully. And, you know, we can take a look at the Umayyad dynasty uh, and the, you know, the things that happened there and just take a look at how Islam spread uh, in Southeast Asia, in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. You know, they just take a look at the traders uh, who were following the Sunnah, and you know they were very impressed by their moral standard uh, and the and the frame of worship, and, and that's Not why. Quite you know, exactly. Again, oh, let, let me finish, Omar. I, I right, didn't right, say anything. Right. Oh, good, good, good. Um, and again, uh, you can say that white people, you know, you know, didn't convert to, to Islam for the longest time, and they've been the historical um, adversary uh, between the Muslim world. Uh, but again, every single Muslim society from the Quraysh. Uh, to the Mongols, uh, to the Muslims in South Asia, all went through a similar process in that there were people in that society that converted to Islam. There were people in their society who were vehemently opposed uh, to Islam in any way, shape, or form. Up until this day, you can look at any country in the world and Islamophobia is just going to be everywhere. I'm not saying that Islamophobia doesn't exist within the Anglosphere. Obviously, it does. Uh, but historically and contemporarily, every single society has been like this. Uh, Kamela Meki, uh, you know, you know, I, you remember telling a story about uh, the one convert um, from sub-Saharan Africa uh, who was basically trying to give dawah to his town, his village. And they said, you know, we're going to kick you out. And if you come back, we're going to kill you. The gentleman went on Hajj, spoke with uh, one of the tabi'in, one of the people who was a scholar. And I was advised what to do. He said, go back to your, go back to your general region, set up a tent uh, and write letters to, to your townsfolk, right? And it was a very slow, arduous process, um, you know, but after a while, he got about five to 10 people who actually went to where he set up shop. Uh, he trained them in Islam. He trained them in, in uh, uh, you know, in life skills. And, uh, you know, it, it was a very long, arduous process, but eventually that entire region ended up converting to Islam. So it's a very simple concept. I mean, look at the concept of Urf uh, in Islam. I mean, to impose another culture onto people or different cultural aspects is actually a form of oppression. Um, now, again, if people want to convert to Islam and they want to marry into a Muslim family, you know, you know it doesn't bother me. I mean, they can do whatever they want. But the the... the <laughs> You know, the gist of it is people just don't want to do that. It's even within Muslim societies. Um, you know, you know, there's a video from uh, Corey Goldschuster uh, you can watch. And, you know, I'm not a fan of his politics, but he interviewed Muslims living in, in Palestine. Who, who is asking, by the way? Corey He's an Israeli, U Israeli YouTube Israeli YouTuber. Guy. He okay. interviews yeah. Israelis and Palestinians. Pretty good channel. I like his channel. Yeah, yeah I like his channel, too. So, I, you know, one of the questions was, you can look it up. Um, he asked people, you know, he asked Palestinians. Uh, living in the West Bank, you know, would you marry somebody from Hebron uh, or Gaza? And, you know, it had nothing to do with geography. They just said the cultures are way, way too different. So the overwhelming majority yeah. of Muslims living in Muslim society don't even want to marry, by and large, 
uh, Muslims from and even an adjacent Muslim city or Muslim yeah. country. So it, what it, makes us think that this is going to work out with converts, whether they're white, Latino, or, or, okay. or African-American? Okay, let me jump in here. Are, are, are you, Rob, are you done But before? Are you done? done? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, the solution is very simple. I mean, again, this has been going on for a very long time. And look, you know, when we look at Moneyball, you know, like for the longest time, Bill, everyone thought Bill James was an idiot. Billy Bean. Uh, uh, from Moneyball, the gentleman who wrote the book on uh, sabermetrics. Yeah. You mean Billy yeah. Bean, right? Uh, yeah, Billy Bean was the one who implemented it, but it took someone who had the, uh, uh, the knowledge, wherewithal, and the drive uh, and the authority to be able to, to, to effectuate that process. And now right. every single sport uses this particular process. So yeah. um, again, it may just be that we're using a different method. Maybe let's try to let uh, you know Europeans keep their culture, go back to their traditional cultures, and, and marry within the Anglosphere, so we can be of best use to the Ummah, and that is by giving dawah to our peoples, which is absolute necessity. And the fact that we haven't done that, we're doing a great disservice, not just to ourselves, but to the Muslim community uh, at large. Can I respond, Mahin? Absolutely, go for it. Okay. First of all, if I hear about a launch angle again, you, you turn to a baseball game now and it's overwhelmed with sabermetrics. I can, I don't have to hear about velocity and launch angles again. Now to the top of a good hand, I watched that video from Corey Gil Schuster actually. Uh, and I like the channel and that's certainly true in Muslim countries and particularly of older generations and less educated generations. Um, but what we're dealing with in America is a very diverse Muslim community. And this is the reality. Religion as a whole is on a decline in America, is in a steep decline in America. And this is backed by data. If you look to my grandparents' generation, it was unheard of to meet an atheist. Nearly everyone was a member of some kind of religious congregation. This is my grandparents' generation. In my parents' generation, still the clear majority, at least sometimes attended religious services. Even in my generation, Generation X, a very large percentage attended religious services, and I never met a single atheist growing up, okay? Now, that might have been different if you grew up in San Francisco or Berkeley or Manhattan you know, or something like that. But religion is on the decline in America, and religiosity among Muslims is also on the decline uh, in America. So marrying someone out outside of your race is really not a big issue uh, in the Muslim community in America because we have an increasing number of Muslims, women included, marrying non-Muslims, and it's not an issue. And I believe that, you know, if you look a couple generations back, it was almost unheard of for Jews to intermarry in America, almost unheard of. Now, if you're not an Orthodox Jew, the intermarriage rates are in excess of 70%. And I believe we could see something like that similar uh, definitely with a lot of South Asian women marrying uh, non-Muslim women. I think, I think that's a trend uh, that will continue uh, to increase. So marrying outside your race is not a big deal in America. Uh, and, re and religion as a whole is on the decline in America, not just uh, Islam. The, we, we have to realize is that this existing Muslim community in America, the Muslims who know who Mahin the podcaster is and watch Mad and Mamluks are a very small percentage. Most second generation Muslim kids are not religious at all. They don't know who Hamza Yusuf is. They don't care. They don't know who Linda Sarsour is, and they don't care. They don't know anything about the organized Muslim community. They're just living kind of a normative life. Mm -hmm. so, so the white people that are marrying into the Muslim community uh, and practice tend to be marrying into those families that are more religious than your average uh immigrant Muslim family. But that's not going to work for everything. But the vast majority, I mean, I'm just going to ask you, I've met probably hundreds of white converts over the years, and I can count on my hand the number that are married to white people. No, I don't disagree with you, but yeah. I've asked the same people, and I said, if you could go back in time, if there was um, a, a, a sub-community of European descendant Muslims, would you have married, um, or even just converts? And they said, yeah, in a heartbeat. You know, and uh, again, like you're, it's it's a, it's a, it's an attrition bias, uh, Omar. Uh, these there are many normal people who I talk to from my hometown. They said, you know, what? I believe Islam is true. You know, I think it's a, I think it's great. I think it's you know, like even though you know I, I wouldn't become fully practicing, 
Uh, but you know, but the problem is like, you know, I would face, so I would face a lot of, you know, my, I get ostracized from my family. I mean, I'd be, you know, just the way of life is different. Um, so I mean, but again, the, once you establish the ecosystem there, again, having, uh, people with this, it's not just about race. This is about culture. This is about many things, religiosity. This is about, um, sociology. You know, like going through this, the sociology, going through the same, uh, experiences as human beings. And, you know, and let, and born people born into a Muslim background are in a totally different paradigm and a totally different situation. Yeah, for sure. And converts. And you want to marry somebody who is going through the same thing or very similar things that you are, uh, by and large. And that's what's going to make the marriages last. See, and a lot of these marriages end in divorce. I mean, yeah, they talk, do. I agree. And that's, okay. and, so, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a failed model. Uh, I mean, like I've talked to imams or people who arrange uh, these, these kinds of marriages in Toronto. And he says the divorce rate of born Muslims marrying uh, converts is 80 to 90 percent. Mm. And I'm not I'm not placing the blame on either side, um, you know, but again. But the divorce rate only, is high, period. It's the only option. It, well, so let, let, let me let me jump in real quick. So, number one, Omar mentioned an interesting point. Um, wait, you didn't mention the point. You got me thinking. You got you triggered something in my head. <clears throat> so you've got a lot of second generation. So I agree with you that 80% of the Muslims who are like, or we call them, they fall under the banner of Islam al-Qibla in America, don't even, aren't even pray, like barely praying, right? If that, like they right. might, like the most common denominator in me is like they ain't eating pork. They don't eat pork, right? Yeah, they'll probably- And they, and they don't like Ram Israel. They only yeah. pork and don't like Israel. That's <laughs> no, not even that anymore. If you, if you go to like, the, you, now it's very Daisy's, man. We got a Kanza got yeah, a Yeah, yeah Daisy's don't care. This is don't care. But like the point is what I've seen personally and a lot of um, because because I grew up with a lot of like, you know, I, I come being from a Bangladeshi background. Right. Our demographic Bangladesh is a 90 percent Muslim country. Yeah. But our families came over for education. Right? right. And they end up in very like small. They, they're like PhDs. It's academic culture. So you have all the Bangladeshis that ended up in small towns all across America. My right. wife's from my my grew up in Ida Bina, Mississippi, for example, mm. right? Dang. So Mississippi you know, Masala territory. A little bit north. Mississippi Masala is Biloxi. What? No, Biloxi. actually it's close. No, sorry. You're you're yeah. absolutely on point. Because yeah. Mississippi the, the motel they that uh the family owned was in Greenwood, which yeah. is where she high school. You you yeah, you're, my, my bad you got it. Okay. There you go, man. But um what my but the point is that generally speaking you're you're basically surrounded by the main the outside community and you Correct. phase out. You're not you're culturally Muslim, and so those people are marrying white folks. Yes, and, and that's why when you wa watch the Daisy comedians, yeah, it's like the widest stuff ever. It's like the widest cadence, the widest humor, because they're they're growing up completely surrounded right. by white people. Right. Yeah. So so yeah. that's one thing. So 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 now that now we're but we're not talking about that because right. that's white secular person marrying like. Like, uh, basically, yeah. And, you know, by name, cultural Muslim, their kids are not going to be Muslim. Right. Bet, bet on it, right? Uh, That's right. not what we're talking about, right? It's a mismatch religi religiosity wise, but continue, Mahin. Yeah. So yeah. that's, yeah. so we just want to make sure we, we define the scope of this, right? So okay. Okay. we're not talking about that, those people. Right. We're talking about religious people, people who consciously convert to Islam. Right. White people, consciously convert to Islam, whether male or female marrying other white converts who are also consciously converting versus marrying people of other backgrounds. Now, let me ask, I, I want to posit a question to Rob. What about, so there's certainly a convert experience that's shared, right? Generally speaking, right? You hear a lot, um, you know, in like amongst convert community, for con converts that Often it's they're hiding in the Quran, they're hiding in the, their rooms praying. They can't let their parents find the Quran, right? Um, but it's almost like, would you be open, Rob, to the idea of converts marrying other converts, irrespective of background? So white converts marry Latino converts versus African American converts, because at the end of the day, it are like, how, what culture do we really have in America? You know what I'm saying? It's just like. Uh yeah, that's an exponentially better situation. Uh, you know, again, converts, I'm not going to, if you create a Venn diagram, uh, you know, white converts and Latino converts and African-American converts, uh, we share a lot of commonalities and we have, you know, the, so there's many similar experiences there. 
But for the average person uh, who converts to Islam, that is an un, that is an it's a it's a huge jump, and there's a lot of uh, you know adjustments you have to make with your family. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, lifestyle changes you need to make, and I think it should be it, it should be the exception and, and not the rule. Um, you know, be, you want to marry someone who's gone through as many of the similar experiences that you have. Anything that could be done to quote unquote grease the wheels uh, to make it easier on the on the in laws, um, you know. Again, should be done to its to its to its greatest effect. Again, Umar said it. I mean, very few white converts marry each other, um, and, and you know, there's just not that option there. Uh, so again, we need to create. But also, that Rob. Also, Rob. If you look with white, okay, I gotta just keep it real. I had no interest in marrying a white. Woman. Okay, let's start with that. Okay, but and I disagree with your point that people need to come in at the same level. I think it's great. If you can come in and, and have Muslim in-laws and Muslim family and learn from them and, 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 you know, they can be your teachers and mentors and elders and take you in with love and care and you can become part of their extended family. I know it's ideal. It, it doesn't always happen like that, but if Very it does, rarely. I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. If it does but, happen, I mean that, go ahead. But when we're talking about white women converts, it's almost like looking at white girls at a hip hop show. Okay, they're not there for the white dudes. You know what I'm saying? A lot of white women converts, I'm mean, almost all of them I've known either have an Arab, mostly have an yeah. Arab fetish. You know what I'm saying? You know, they, they, uh, and in post 9 11, and there was an old head brother told me this was going to happen. He was like, watch, Muslim dudes are going to become the end thing for progressive white women to marry because, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be like cool and hip. You know, what? look, father. Here is my Habib, you know, th th you know, that kind of rebelliousness against whiteness in marrying an Arab. So I don't see too many white uh, Muslim women that are interested in I, white dudes. Again, it's a selection bias. It's not yeah. that, again, if you take an even like that 20% that uh, Dalia Mogahed, uh, the ISPU found out every single poll, you know, uh, you know, you're probably talking about one to 2% of these, uh, you know, uh, of white women who are activists who convert to Islam. Yeah, and, very small percentage, and yeah. So again, like it's not that pe normal, everyday, apolitical white people are not going to convert to Islam. Is that it's that they read it, they think it's the truth, but at the same time, there's actually nothing uh, for them to go on, and they know that they're yeah. going to get ostracized and cut out from their family. But that, and the mosque, neither the mosque nor the university organizations are going to be able to handle something like that. And a lot of these, and again, a lot of these marriages are, are relationships are occurring between a. A, a, a white woman who dates a non-practicing Muslim man, uh, and then she finds out about, uh, about Islam from him or his family, uh, which is fine. I'm not going to dispute her her sincerity in that. But again, you have a, a mismatch in reli religiosity from the get-go, and the vast majority of those marriages that we've seen, and you can attest to this, Omar, the end in divorce, and yeah, the I family agree. goes, "I told you so," and then you're right back to where you started. So it just goes back to the whole car but, analogy. But back to Dali Mugad in this study. Uh, I believe that the majority of that 20% is not white converts. It's Arabs who self-identify well, as white. Arab, they they and, said and, Arab and, was yeah, an option on that. Uh, yeah, but right. But some people, even when given Arab, they'll choose white because they're white on the census. And, you know, and we have other things. I also disagree with Dahlia. Uh, you know, I disagree with a lot of the points she made, you know, from these studies. But one of them was that, you know, because we saw a large percentage of Muslims vote for Donald Trump, unfortunately, in the last election. But she attributed to that to, to people that identify as white, uh, which those numbers just strictly did not add up. The no. fact is, for whatever reason, there were a lot of Arabs and Daisies and, and other Muslims that uh, voted for Trump. It had nothing to do with well, people. I think you're talking about Mahdi, Mahdi Hassan's retweet of that. Dahlia went into detail uh, on the podcast. Did you watch the whole thing or? No, I just saw clips of it. I didn't watch the whole thing. So, I, 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 don't re I, I don't really care for his analysis, to be honest with you. But yes. So I, I have a question uh, yeah. so, for, for, for Rob. Um, so let's say you have you have two white converts, right? Um, there's obviously the, then the nuance of, so let's say both of them come from Islamophobic families, right? So then they, so it can be two, it, you can have one of two things happening there. You could have the, the couple embrace each other because they're, both dealing with crap on the home front 
or the stress of it amplifies it because like one side can't take shelter in the other. You follow what I'm saying? So we need to roll it back really, you know, we need to roll it back here a lot here. So even before the whole idea, you know, and let's go way before marriage here. Um, you know, when people, white people convert to Islam, you get a range of opinions uh, yep. from their family. Yep. Like when I converted my family, I had no problem with me converting to Islam. My dad shook my hand. Um, you get, you know, one or two people in your family might hate it. You might have some converts who have families that are neutral on Islam. They couldn't, yeah. couldn't care one way or the other. And yeah. you have some pe white people who sometimes if they do convert to Islam, their family is very Islamophobic. So you have a range uh, of responses there. And the best thing that we can do and the best thing we can do for the greater Muslim community as a whole is have a collective identity, have a collective organization where we're still interacting day by day with the, with the greater Muslim community. But our mandate is to uh, reach uh, the converts' families and be able to um, incrementally, inshallah, uh, lower their Islamophobia. And you know, I was in a marriage in which my uh, my family had no problem with me being Muslim, and my spouse at the time they were very Islamophobic. Um, so that's a situation in which they loved me right off the bat, and they, you know, like it took a lot of work and a lot of it was it was hard. It was not easy, and you couldn't even talk about Islam. They wanted it to be out of sight, out of mind. The best thing you do in that case as a white convert is to follow the sunnah and incrementally they got rid of, you know, they, their opinion on Islam changed. And at the end, even though it didn't work out for other reasons, uh, you know, they were asking me about my Umar trip. They, you know, they, they were pretty fascinated by it. Um, so that's one situation in which you have a convert to Islam that ha family has no problem with it. And there are many converts like that and the, an Islamophobic family. So that's a situation in, in which it can work out. But to roll it all the way back, I mean, that's what we're dealing with here. Um, you know, again, there's Islamophobia within, within the Anglosphere, just like any other community, whether that's going to be Hindu, which is far worse, uh, the Arab Christian community. Uh, and again, uh, the best, uh, anything that can be done to grease the wheels, is, and that is that we have an organization where we're able to reach uh, these converts' families and, inshallah, uh, you know, whittle down or at least get, get them to accept the fact that they're, that they're, uh, son or daughter has converted to Islam. And, you know, and that's the best thing we can do because at the end of the day, like Umar said in the last debate we had, you know, like there's a lot of white people protesting against Muslims at these mosques. And, you know, giving them donuts, care giving them donuts is not going to work. Uh, getting into a big uh, melee, I mean, you know, yeah, if you need to defend yourself, by all means, the Muslim community has every right to defend themselves in that situation. But for white converts, the best thing that we can do, and this is the, the same thing that progressive Muslims and Muslims across the board have told us, is that give dawah to your family. That's impossible, extremely difficult to do as a singular person. And that's why we need to take this communitarian approach. Mahin, I want to I want to skip forward a little bit because there are two uh, important issues. Number one, I don't think the biggest issue is the, the reaction of white families to conversion. Uh, because most converts I meet, I mean, some of them do have problems, but most of the families are pretty chill. I mean, my family was pretty chill. And, and that's what I think happens most of the time. The problem converts have is not with their families. It's at the masjid. It's at the Muslim community. Is they can't find a home. They can't find a community to embrace them. Um, and they become socially isolated and eventually go their own way. So the, that's, that's the big issue. Now, moving forward with this concept of a white Muslim organization. Now, I know that Rob is not promoting this, but when I look at the Twitter sphere, the segment of MT that the ideal of white Muslim identity has become popular, it at times, joins with or at times is the same thing as what we the muslim reich you know the the these kind of neo-nazi muslims these white identity muslims and not even that far okay let's because you know uh i went down a hole of following a bunch of these accounts i mean i didn't follow them you know i went and looked at a bunch of these accounts uh you know and you know they not just uh you know, from, from you, Rob, but they were liking tweets from, you know, that Maliki Fick, that, what's the guy named in Ali. Washington? Uh, yeah, the, him and my buddy Ismail, you know. Maliki Klik isn't a white supremacist. 
Uh, I would argue that uh, he, you know, he's very near the white supremacy. He's married. Uh, he's married to another white. <laughs> okay, him. that's fine. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, there's this. It reads a lot like Robert Spencer. It reads a lot like white. Robert Reaver. or Richard? R- Richard? It's, Richard Spencer? I mean, R- Richard Spencer. Excuse me, Richard Spencer. Yeah. It reads a lot like Richard Spencer mm. uh, and these kind of white incel uh, podcasters. Uh, even though white Muslims are usually not incels because they can get married, uh, without Islam, they probably would be incels. But this whole kind of, you know, uh, alt right podcaster vibe which is based on white grievance and white nationalism and the thought that white society and civilization is under threat due to immigration due to lower birth rates etc so there is a segment of muslims that are openly promoting these ideas and there is a segment that may not be promoting them but they're kind of soft towards these ideas and when I look at the basis of Islam in America, the heart and soul of Islam in America didn't come from immigrants, actually. It came from Malcolm. It came from African-American Muslims. And at the core was very much a, uh, a fight against white supremacy. And what did Malcolm, and again, I quoted the Malcolm X quote in his autobiography, mm-hmm. and, and the, Bilal Harding from the Features, who you know, we've become good friends now, alhamdulillah, you know, he, he was in agreement with me that, uh, that you know, white Muslims should have their own, uh, should work on giving dawah to their people. I mean, this is very important work. Um, and, and I know you said that I, I don't support, uh, you know, these type of like, uh, you know, like uh, any type of white nationalist uh, talking points. Um, uh, uh, Rob, real quick, cause I, I, I want to get some definition here because like, because who like, I, I don't, unless Omar doesn't want to mention my name, like who are these um White supremacist Muslims. That's they're, what I'm, they're I'm, not, I'm, I'm, again, oh, I'm confused. Like, like, so what, well, okay, let, 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 what are they specifically okay, saying? Are they saying yeah, that yeah. they encourage violence against against? Yeah, Muslims? yeah. So, so, so we got there's a spectrum. Okay. Yeah, like kind of generally conservative. That's one thing, right? Okay. Yeah. That's kind of like the Ismail Roy or that kind of thing, right? Sure. But then there's like a further right. Okay, some of them call themselves the Muslim right. You know, like the. The fourth. They're, they're called they're themselves a Muslim, right? Right. There's a right. I've never yeah, heard that right. before. Yeah, no, it's on Twitter. Trust me. Look, I don't. Look I don't. Again, if it's anyone, different. again, we can't. Again, I don't no, support this. Type what of I'm saying. Activity. What I'm saying is, it's 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 far to the right. It's much further to the right than Rob, you know, and, and me and anyone else. But the language at times kind of comes together. This thought of, you know, um, of white grievance. And I don't think you could have a white Muslim organization that, I mean, look, imagine in 2021, you saying you wanted to create a white Christian organization because Christianity has had the same problems. Again, we don't say white. We say Europeans. Right. right. Same thing. So um, Martin Luther King said the most segregated place in America is, is, is a Sunday morning at 11 because of the division in the black and white church. Any, all so Christianity will be invited to our message. So Christianity has had the same issue, you know what I'm saying? And and uh, there would be no way to keep it white. Okay, you're going to have a masjid. It's going to be a white masjid. Okay, uh, a Daisy guy works in a neighborhood. He wants to go to Juma there. Okay, a black guy moves in a neighborhood. He wants to go to Juma there. Next thing you know, white people are yeah. in a minority. It would be hard to keep we're it at white. The con- that's why we're at the conceptual sure. level. We're not at that level yet. So, I mean, an office space with the musalla is, is basically, if we had a brick and mortar organization. But again, any any Muslim could come and pray there. But again, if our... You know, like, and I get what you're saying. If we open up a mosque uh, in a city, any type of city, really, I mean, you're, the overwhelming majority of the congregation will be will be not white. Yes. And you know that, that that's going to be expected. But our mandate is to give dawah to our, our our families and our communities. And you know, even my dad, who's got a very positive image of Islam and had nothing hateful to say about Muslims at all, um, you know, I could not get him to go to a mosque because it's not, it's, he just didn't feel comfortable there. It's not his turf. And, you know, if you talk to the many Muslim communities, they don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, bringing in and talking to, um, you know, like uh, white people's families who may be opposed to, to Islam as well. You know, you're just not going to get these people to meet by and large. Um, look, these masjids are set up 
I think they're similar to like a mm-hmm. Bulgarian Orthodox Church, a Romanian Orthodox Church, or an Armenian Apostolic uh, uh, Orthodox Church. These are immigrant congregations, right? Mm-hmm. So what they're set up to do is to preserve the culture and pass it on to the next generation. Mm-hmm. Culture probably being more important than religion mm-hmm. for many of these families, right? So th- they're definitely not going to expend a lot of resources on bringing my dad in, which my dad would have exactly. no interest whatsoever anyway, or your dad, you know. Um, so that's to be expected. But, you know, there's nothing stopping you or me or any white convert from talking to our families, from letting them meet or, you know, in the course mm-hmm. of my nearly 30 years, as a Muslim going on 30 years, uh, my family has met a lot of my Muslim friends. So my family has become Again. friends. With Again, my Muslim it's a yeah. selection bias. It's a selection bias, yeah. Omar. It's not that people, white people, who are you know, um, who come from Islamophobic families, well, they, 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 they don't convert to Islam. They believe it in their heart. It's just that the, uh, the fallout of them converting to Islam is going to be uh, major, and that's why you generally you see the white people who do convert to Islam. Generally, their family is either neutral. They may have a few family members who dislike it, or they, they have no problem with them converting to Islam. Well, so that it's, that's the dilemma that we're facing. So well, that's, where you get, that's where you get into a theological uh, mm-hmm. thing, and probably where we theologically differ, and I probably theologically differ with uh, Mahin uh, as well, because, um, you know, I very much like Islam. I very much believe Islam is the best religion. Tawheed makes sense. Uh, you know, prof, the, the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam definitely makes the most sense to me. Uh, I see every other religion uh, as inferior. Uh, that's my personal um, belief. Um, but I do not believe that my non-Muslim grandmother is going to be burning in hell. I don't believe that good people of other religions uh, who are good people are gonna be burning in hell. That's a theological uh, uh, position. So my argument is if conversion does not benefit you spiritually, socially, and materially, and often is to your detriment spiritually, socially, and materially, then um, I would advise against it unless you can come in in a good situation. Let me give you an example. I know white people and, from middle class, highly educated families uh, that were on a clear path to success in life. They converted to Islam, went to Islamic extremism. Some of them ended up in prison and some of them ended up uh, basically living on the margins of society. Uh, Conversion, even though they pray five times a day, uh, they read Quran, you know, their kids may be Muslim, uh, but conversion definitely did not uh, work out for these individuals, so I think I think for all people, it's it's not necessarily um, the best decision. If you look at the Muslim Ummah now, I remember in the '90s when Hijra was seen as mandatory, and people thought it was wider to make Hijra. I so still people, do. So there you go. So people looked at the globe, and they said, "Okay, what Muslim country has a decent standard of living?" And the fact of the matter is there aren't that many Muslim countries that are a decent place to live, right? Maybe in the Gulf or Malaysia, et cetera, right? And so kind of going there is kind of like looking at the Titanic. It's 80% underwater and then buying a ticket to get on the Titanic. Jeremiah Tablik used to say, we don't give dawah because the Muslims... They give dawah yeah. to Muslims, but not to non-Muslims because the state of Muslims is yeah. so bad that if, if Islam is strong, people exactly. will be uh, coming. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that hey, they've been saying that for centuries. So it, they're the only dawah or major dawah organization in North America, as far as, far as I know. Um, and they don't even want to give dawah to non-Muslims. So who's going to do that? Yeah. And it's not, it's not always about conversion because hey, I, I know- R- R- Rob, I actually, I, I actually want to interject real quick. So number one, uh, sorry, Muslim Reich, I Googled it on Twitter. Um, this there's an account called Muslim Reich. It's at Muslim underscore Reich. Um, it has eight followers. <laughs> no, no, there's a no, no. Trust me, there's a bunch of them. I went down the rabbit okay. hole. Okay, all right. So, we'll, we'll, we'll just they, just send them to me on the side. We we, we I, I will just I'll, be, I'll just look in well, right. Yeah, they might be on Gab now. They might be on uh, okay. What's it called? Parler. They might have been booted Parler. off Twitter. Oh, I could I could but there I was could a go, lot of them. Omar. Yeah. I could go on a Twitter search and you know yeah. and look up your Twitter and find someone who's following you and then for sure. Sure. Who says, you know, like we should kill all white people. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, like, 
Well, I doubt yeah. that, but you right. might find some nuts. Oh, it only takes me a couple of minutes. But, but, but yeah. I, 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 I want to talk a little about Omar's point, which I think um, – I think is kind of like borderline. It sounds like per, you you and you you preface that by saying that theologically, you, this is probably something where me and Rob would disagree with you on, right? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. but you but you know, so as far as I know, the orthodox understanding of Islam is that we don't make it's. I'm not concerned about whether your grandmother is going to paradise or heaven, right? We don't mm -hmm. know that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like because that's at Allah's hands he yes. ultimately is the judge he gives us the guidelines only thing we know is so let me ask you this do you make dua for your like uh grandmother to you know or is that something that you because i, I think that's maybe where we disagree because i would say okay you i wouldn't make dua for, for like my non-muslim friend after they passed away right if they died upon i would but i wouldn't say they're going to hell i was i don't know that's not my yeah, business i mean i make dua and i visit you know when I'm in St. Louis, I yeah. visit Jeff Jefferson Barracks uh, Cemetery where her and my grandfather are buried. Well, visiting uh, a cemetery, I think is fine. I, like, but I'm saying, like, you know, I, but I think there's specific injunctions against asking for salvation, which we know from which from the so so that, that I'm asking that um, for, first and foremost. Uh, I do. But, okay. Okay. Do. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. So, I, yeah. but the, the the other question is this. So, so you mentioned the, the, the you mentioned some examples of like people who honestly it's like some people like. Like granted, some Muslims, when some converts, when they convert, they like leave their brain somewhere else. Yes. Right. Okay. Like, um, I don't know if y'all have, um, y'all, Omar, you, you know, you got, I know you got an Audible account. Did you have you listened to American ISIS yet? Yes, I did. Okay. I made hold on. I made a YouTube review uh, of the podcast. I encourage both of you to watch my YouTube review because one of the things I'm trying to do now is get some money together for the widow and the mother of those children. And those children are entitled to American citizenship uh, and hopefully they can leave Syria and come to America. Okay. Yeah. So, so, but, but this is, this is, this is my take on when I was listening to this, obviously mm -hmm. this guy was sincere. I think, yes. right. He was very yeah. sincere. hundred percent. Just ended up in the wrong hands. Okay. Well, well, look. If he would have stayed in Philadelphia with the African American Muslims, yeah, and the African American Muslim community, for not everybody, but like for me, is the best place to be within the American Muslim community. If he'd have stayed with them, they would have kept him level. The problem is his family moved down to Florida. To well, he was in, he was in Pittsburgh, not Philly. No, he was in Philly. He, he was, was Philly. okay, okay. So yeah, yeah. but anyways. Yeah. But, but yeah. my, my my point is though, yeah. even the fact that he died at whatever age 38, 39, as a member of ISIS, yeah. right? I can still now say Rahimullah, I, I and I believe he will go to Jannah. Man, I was so that. sad. But hold on. You know he, what I'm saying? Look, look, so man, at the end of the day, did he win or no? In the big picture. Man, right? he was he was failed by the Muslim community. Because let me let me let me mm -hmm. finish. When he got down to Florida, right. And he started going to the predominantly quote unquote immigrant masjid. Mm -hmm. They rebuffed him. They didn't want to have nothing to do with him because he's a working class guy, because he's a convert, yep. probably because he's white too. They didn't want to have nothing to do with him. And then so he starts going online. He goes online. You know, he finds ISIS and the rest is history. So the Muslim community failed that guy. But then you, what's the, what's the care of Florida guy name that they interviewed? Um, I forget. You know, uh, uh, yeah, he's kind of a he's kind of a Muslim celebrity, uh, you know, a minor a Muslim celebrity, but Ahmed Bedir or something like that. Um, uh, uh, he's like, yeah, this guy wouldn't have been. I mean, just had such a disdainful attitude for him. You know what I'm trying to say? Right. And this is this is one of the things. Can I cuss? Uh sure. Okay. Most white converts are dick riders. They're cultural appropriators and dick riders. You know what I'm trying to say? And that's why I don't get along with a lot of people because I'm not kissing nobody's ass. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm, if I go into masjid and I hear something disrespectful, uh, I might, you know, I might be going to jail that night. You know what I'm trying to say? So they're used to getting their ass kissed by these oddball converts. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so a guy like him, Russell Dennison, Abdullah was his name, wasn't going to fit in. But the attitude they have is so disdainful for Muslim converts. You got to understand this. This goes back to this point. A minority, a small minority of second generation Muslims in America are religious. Mm -hmm. They, 
a lot of them see Islam as more as, a, as an ethnic immigrant identity. And they have a disdainful attitude towards religion and kind of a rebellious attitude towards their parents. So when they see a convert, picking up a religion that they're trying to get rid of, or they feel that they've been saddled with, or they feel that they've been burdened with, um, um, a lot of them immediately look down at you. Also take context, many of these people are classes. So if they're a doctor, IT professional, engineer, and they come in and you're like Abdullah Russell Dennison, fresh out the penitentiary, they're automatically going to look down at you. And with the whole CVE thing, with a lot of these suburb, suburban masters, they might call the cops like, hey, this guy, he looks shady. You know, that's exactly what happened in Northern Virginia at Adams Center. You had a, a convert. He was having hard times. He shows up to Mastia for help. They called the feds on. Mm -hmm. OK, so what kind of what kind of environment is this for me to encourage someone uh, to go into? At this OK, point? so 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 you, so you guys are you guys agree on you guys agree <laughs> on the problems. Yeah, you guys yeah, are 100 percent aligned on the problem. I want to say 100 percent, but we agree on we brought you know, pretty we agree much on the as yeah, problems, much. right? Yeah. But yeah. but to me, I, like so, this is where I would agree with Rob in the sense that like you convert because we convert for salvation. We convert because yeah. Islam is the truth, and that is right. Now, if somebody decides to convert because they, 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 they want to get with some cute Moroccan chick, then yeah. you know that's on them. But that's yeah. like. You, but you don't make rules based on the exceptions, right? Generally speak, to be honest, like a, a, a random. Why you say Moroccan? Sorry. Why you say Moroccan, bro? That's what, that's what I'm trying to go to Hijra, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Got to learn French, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, right? You, yeah. I'll come there. You teach me, but but I feel like you guys are agree in agreement on the symptoms and yeah. just the approach. Like Omar's like, let's back up on the conversions. Let's let's yes. hold off. Yeah. And like, let's not put people into, um, so, so yeah, I guess point. you're yes. interrogating. If you're inter if you're going to interrogate people the way Omar thinks that, that they should, they're going to run away. I mean, they're just, you're going to scare 99% of them off. If you have they're going to be gone anyway. Like ours, huh? They're going to be gone anyway. You need someone you need. Yeah. I mean, again, the more experience you have, the better chance we have of reaching them and saying, look, like who knows all the pitfalls and knows, you know, where, where not to go. Um, you know, that's get the best chance to reach them. And you're not going to reach all of them. Uh, but if you have an organization like ours, um, or again, like, again, I'm not denigrating the African American community or the Latino Muslim community, like Islam and Spanish, they do a lot of great work. And I'm sure if a white convert came to them, you know, they would help them to the best of their ability. But again, um, you know, the, the, you know, many of these, many of these, uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim communities don't, interact on a constant basis with the Anglosphere like we do. So and again, we have the experience of dealing with Islamophobic family members, with dealing with the, this inevitable uh, social loss, uh, loss of social capital that's going to occur with these uh, European descendant converts. Um, so that's why we're in place to be able to stop these problems from happening, inshallah. Uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least we tried our best. Sure. So, um, so Rob, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. You know, you um, you you were on a we did, we did a clubhouse room that I moderated with Mike Swice of Totleaf mm -hmm. um several months back. So you're like Totleaf has a very except it's just not white European centered necessarily, yeah. right? They have Hipster. you know, but but it's a place that like is a third space. Now, funny Mike like is paranoid about getting doxxed by like people who are like um maybe too woke because they got too many white folks on the board at Tot Leaf. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But like, right. like he was talking about like anybody like actually looks at like who's on the board, Mike Swice, Will Caldwell, you know, bunch of ex like bunch of white converts. Oh yeah. He but, told me but, that he's afraid of getting doxxed by these other. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's, isn't Tot Leaf. Uh, so, so what's your take? So Islam for Europeans has a, you know, certain a angle, but it seems like you would work hand in hand with organizations like Tatleaf. They Absolutely. would be like a partner. They would be like a, a partner with a very similar goal, slightly different methodology. So you're on board with you. Would, you it would take to say that you're more or less like on board with them in the Converts, grand scheme. Converts in general should have their own organizations. Converts from every yeah. um, um, group or communitarian group, whether that's uh, yeah. European descendant converts, black right. con black converts, Latino, First right. Nations, they should all have all theirs as well. Mm -hmm. Hold on, um, hold on. Can I address Talif? Sure, go for it. Talif is not for converts. Talif is for Muslim hipsters. That's like a hipster organization 
You don't say Allah, you say like the divine, the creator, all stuff. Like I don't have a problem with Talif, but the common denominator of Talif is kind of middle to upper class, uh, second generation, a lot of second generation daisies, kind of woke politically, generally progressive, right? And, uh, you know, comes out of the Bay, that whole kind of Bay, you know, wellness, pseudo spirituality, Sufi light, you know, message of healing and wellness, you know, but it's a very upper class thought, you know, and there's a reason that some of the intelligence agencies had a great interest in Talif because Osama Cannon, African American, uh, uh, Islam and Black Islam in America was seen as too masculine, too militant, too working class, too Salafi. And Talif and uh, Osama Cannon was seen as something that could be a moderating force and also a good international force for public diplomacy uh, for the United States. Now, I would argue that Talif Chicago has improved on that model because Ubeda Law Evans, to me, is one of the best thinkers, best personalities best speakers in the Muslim community today. And I think he's broadened the Talif approach. It's still middle to upper class. It's still not geared towards working class people and not really geared towards Congress either, you know, they're free to go. Uh, but I think he's broadened the appeal and made it less kind of like yoga, you know, <laughs> You know yoga. that kind of thing that it was in in in, in California. Oh, let me let, let me we're gonna, we're gonna do Tennyson. So real quick, because <laughs> like I, I've never been to Leaf in the Bay. I only know Tatleaf Chicago. I donate to Tatleaf, yeah. and I yeah. designate my funds to Chicago. Um, you got the big guys, money, so you can donate all the, different kind of places. Yeah, the, the guys in Chicago um, are a lot of my are my really good friends. At the, but I disagree. The organization is for converts, and I'll tell you why I know this. Because there are certain events that I'm blocked off from where it's yeah. converts only. Yeah. Oh, nice. Right? Yeah. Okay. The, the, it's known for converts or unless, or if you're mentoring somebody, you get to go. It's not like open up. They have the general community. Now, they have convert the, events. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Now, here's the thing. They have like um, the reason you're getting the hipster Muslim, the yup, because it's like, because if it's comfortable for a convert, for converts, right? It's comfortable for some dude who's, who's a middle of nowhere, Georgia, for example. Some Daisy kid grows up there because his dad's a professor at UGA in Athens, right? For example, instance, I'm not, not just right. archetyping anybody, you know. And moves then, into Hyde Park. Yeah, moves to Chicago, take, works at Deloitte. And then, right. oh, he knows he's Muslim. The mosques are too extreme for him. So he goes to Talib. Right. And you got a bunch of those people. You, you, Chicago, and, 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 and it's a good place to meet girls. Exactly, exactly. Like, honestly, yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I, I know people who Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah's lectures when we used to have him on Thursday nights there at the old Talif location on the north side just right. to meet just to meet chicks. Right. So, I mean, right. that's – and it was like that, you know, and you're – because it's it's very – it's it's a very um environment that it, – it's a place that I would – if I ever had somebody who's interested in Islam, like I've had coworkers that I thought were interested in Islam, and I brought them to Talif. I, I wouldn't bring them to yeah. Masjid. But I'm going to say something. Right. Listen. I'm not dissing Talib because I love Ubaidullah. I right. like Mike Swice too. Right. And um, uh, it's, it's just too bougie for me. It's too mm -hmm. hipster for me. I'm, I'm too much of a working class guy. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to address something else Rob said. I think a lot of it gets down to taste in your personal experience. I think Rob is more normative European, North American than I am. You know what I'm trying to say? Rob is you more think? comfortable. Yeah, I think Rob. Yeah, white town in, in, in Canada, 95% yeah, 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 white. Right, I think Rob is more comfortable. Like if I go into a 99% white setting, I'm not comfortable. If I'm in a dinner and it's all white people, I'm not comfortable. Just because of the way I grew up, just because of my background. Understandable. Like I never watched Friends, this is an example. I remember, I remember, I remember when Kurt, I remember when Kurt Cobain died, it was on the news. And I turned to Ismail Royer who was standing next to me and I said, who the fuck is Kurt Cobain? You know, I mean, so, and that was my generation, right? So I'm really out of step with normative white culture. And there was never been a time when I've been like, you know, really, you know, trying to say into it. So uh, for me, if I would look 
oh, this is a white Muslim club and they're having iftar, I'm going to be like, man, that food is not going to have any seasoning. They're going to have raisins and potato salad. You know, I mean, I'm, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to be like, well, this is the end. Let's keep it 100. Look, you know, the... I, 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 uh, I haven't romantically played in the snow. The, so, yeah. yeah. The, no, it is completely understandable why um, both born Muslims and converse such as yourself, Omar, uh, you know, would uh, feel that way. I mean, you know, we're going off, you know, off of, uh, you know, what the media is telling us, uh, you know, we're going off of, you know, the, and again, a lot of born Muslims, they, the only white people, I mean, if you're coming from Palestine, and, you know, and you're coming to, you know, to America, the only white people you're going to see are like cops, uh, you know, like the white people protesting at your masjid. Um, and then when you were in, you know, when you were in Palestine, Israel, you know, white people are basically chasing you all day. So, so it's, it's, you know, like your, your pool of white people is just not going to be good, <laughs> you know, but for me, I know, I know my town, I know my people, I know when I converted, you know, like it was a range of opinions. Uh, some people, you know, they have the reservations about Islam. They don't like Islam. And I strike up a conversation with them at Tim Hortons whenever I can. And mm. usually the outcome is pretty good. Alhamdulillah. You know, I try my best. Uh, Do you wear a like, kufi in public or how did I identify no. you with Muslim? Yeah. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 you know, I, I don't dress in any uh, visible Islamic clothing, but my whole town knows me. A lot of them know that I converted to Islam. And, you know, that's the effort that hum, you know, humble effort that I tried to make uh, to, you know, to improve the status of Islam there. And you got white converts in those small towns like Eau Claire, Wisconsin, you know, like Burlington, Vermont, you know, like, and they're going to be so isolated and, you know, they need, they need tips. They need advice. They need well, look, man. my convert to drive five hours to help give Dawah to their town. And, you know, that's, that's, that's our mandate. That's what we're working on. I said years ago, if you're serious, you can vary. It doesn't matter what color you are. And you are living in a small town or rural area. You, if you're serious, you got to move. Unless, you know, you're not medically able or something, you got to save up the money and you got to move into a city that has a master and I has moved. a little security. No, no, you're right. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. No, you're right. I moved. I mean, like even in Amherstburg, you know, like it was half an hour away from Windsor where the one mosque was. And I made, you know, I had to drive, you know, like at least for Juma prayer just to get that, you know, that the Iman, the Iman boost. Um, you know, and some people do have to move to bigger cities if they're going to convert to Islam. But um, I can totally understand why they want to do that. Uh, but you can't give up on your roots. You can't give up on the town that you grew up with. So you have to go back there. Man, I uh, was just, look, man, people ask me about St. Louis. You know, I've had so much tragedy in my family and so many bad things happened and blah, blah, blah. They're like, why do you have so much love for St. Louis? Why do you keep going back to St. Louis? So I have a real love uh, for St. Louis. And so I'm very involved in my community. Like, I, you know, you I've been in some Muslim discussions where people say, well, you're out of touch, you know, with the mainstream of culture. And this is coming from Muslims who don't even know when the Super Bowl is, right? This is coming, you know, I mean, so uh, I'm very much in touch, you know, um, you know, um, my, you know, that Twitter thing you have where you're at the middle and there's like the wheel, you know, that thing going around, yeah. all the accounts you interact with. Yeah. You know, mine was like one Muslim account. Most of them were boxing, wrestling. Uh, St. Louis political accounts because I don't really deal in MT. It's not my thing. Like I don't blame you. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And so the um, uh, I'm you know I feel that inspired by my Muslim experience and inspired by Islam and inspired by Malcolm and inspired by the elders of the daughter Islam and inspired by my Thursday night class brothers and others. Uh, who are mostly all Black American Muslims, my teacher, Sheikh Rahman Basir, that I have uh, become involved in St. Louis politics and activism, whether that be in the Ferguson uprising, whether that be in the monument protest, uh, whether that be in the, in the uh, mayoral campaign of Mayor Tashar Jones, uh, Kim Gardner, you know, Corey Bush, et cetera. Uh, I'm, I'm probably the most well-known Muslim or one of the three or four most well-known Muslims in St. Louis on um, politics and, um, and, and activism. And I'm not even living in St. Louis full time. I'm in Texas most of the time. But I view that also as a form of Dawa. You know, Dawa is about making the world better, making the world a, a better place. So without converting to Islam, without being a Muslim, I would not be in a position where I was able to positively influence St. Louis. So Dawa is not always handing somebody 
and a Mir right. Ali pamphlet from well, the north side of Chicago. 99% yeah. of it is not like that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Dawa can be other things. You know, we gave shahadas on the streets of Ferguson during the Ferguson uprising. There's a picture of it. So, uh, you know, Dawa can be many different uh, things. And uh, the bottom line is the Muslim community is not functional. If it's not welcoming, if it's not attractive, you're not going to attract too many people. If the Muslim community becomes functional um, and attractive, you're going to naturally um, attract people. You know what I'm saying? And, and I just want to tell you this, man, is because uh, we can't be on here all night, man. I got I got things. Yeah, to do, man. we're nearing two uh, hours. Uh, yeah, and we're nearing two hours, man. My wife's in the other room. I know she's going to be bad. Well, what you talking for two hours, you know? But uh, the, the thing is this, man, is... Um, your iman goes up and your iman goes down. You know what I'm trying to say? And never do you feel closer to the ummah than when the ummah is under threat. Yeah? And no and no greater time do you feel proud to be a Muslim than when you see Muslims doing good. So I'm a huge wrestling fan and I just watch the Olympics wrestling and boxing. And to see our brothers from Dagestan in wrestling and our Chechen brothers in boxing and other Muslims from other Muslim countries, but particularly those two succeed. Uh, it was heartwarming and I got excited for the Muslims <laughs> being victorious. And I feel a kinship with those Muslims from Dagestan and Chechnya. And, you know, I've, people know my history, know I traveled to the area before uh, in the nineties. And I feel a kinship with the Muslims in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and quite frankly, in my heart, I want the Taliban to be good. I want them to be an improved Taliban 2.0. I don't want them to be the, the closed minded and bad Taliban of 96 to 2001. I want them to be a good example of a Muslim government in the 21st century. Now, will, will it happen? Probably not. But there's that peace in your heart that wants Muslims to do good. So to me, one of the great things that Islam has done for me and has done for so many white Muslims is it internationalized you. I doubt that my mother had ever heard of Pakistan or Afghanistan before 9-11. You see what I'm saying? You're in, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and, and to me, eating Pakistani food and Afghani food is normal. And I have friends from all over the world. You know, so I grew up. I grew up a community that was black and white and didn't get along. You know what I'm trying to say? So for me, Islam was something that could rise myself and society above the racial quagmire of America, that in Islam, we are a part of a universal brotherhood. I and, agree. This was the, and this was the message of Malcolm in his chapter on Hajj. And so this is what attracted me and so many others to Islam. Same with me. So for me, Islam has universalized me, given me a global view, and given me brothers and sisters from throughout the world, from Indonesia to the Gambia to Chechnya to Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, etc. And uh, that's something that I love. So I very much love going, and now, again, I do not find the masters in the DFW welcoming. I think they're very closed. They're very Desi dominated. And they're not interested in you unless you are middle class, the upper class Daisy. But when I go to the masters in St. Louis, I very much love seeing Muslims from throughout the world and learning about them, not just <laughs> eating the food, you know, and, and, and that's one of the great things. So if we lose that, to me, you've lost gonna, very something that's, special. That's, that's not what we're advocating. Mm -hmm. And I agree. And I, I, I didn't disagree with anything you stated. Let me give you, let me, let me give one anecdote. I was at the Eid prayer uh, in Toronto. Uh, Eid al-Fitr in 2018, uh, and it was done outside, and you had the Somali community, uh, you know, it was a Somali run mosque, um, you know, they had their uh, Eid prayer, and again, 90% of the congregation was Somalis, and, and other, and we were there as well, but there were, you know, other ethnicities were there too, but it was run by the Somali community of Toronto, you know, so they were doing their Eid prayer, a block north was a Pakistani community run by a Pakistani mosque doing their Eid prayer, just a block north. And during the, you know, during the, right before the chuppah, the imam, you know, he's, he was getting angry. He's just like, why aren't we having, uh, you know, the same Eid prayer? You know, like, why aren't we praying together? And, you know, I thought of it differently. I thought he, what he should have said was, 
after we do our e-prayer, let's walk over to the Pakistani community and give them salam and hug and you know, yeah. may, uh, tell them may Allah accept their fast. So again, yeah. people, they, for the most part, they want to stick to their, to their own communities. That doesn't mean that we should, we should be, that we should be divided as, as, as Muslims. Uh, but uh, again, one of, one of the things that make Islam great is that we have unity through diversity, even in Medina, you know, um, the Aus and the Hazraj, they have their own battle flags and they're from the same culture in the same town and everything. When you, even throughout the Muslim world, you know, wherever, if you go to China, if you go to Xi'an in China, China, Islam looks Chinese. It's, that's basically, it's where, you know, like they, a, a Chinese person can look at that and go, wow, like that, you know, they're, uh, you know, feel an instant connection culturally and Islamically with that experience. So, and that's what makes the Muslim community strong is unity through diversity. And we're living in such an atomized time where everything is just uh, becoming the same and individualized and, you know, people have no connection to their culture. And that makes it very, very difficult for a convert from any background. Uh, but the fact that Islam uh, purifies the cultures throughout the world is what makes the, the Ummah great. So again, I mean, you can look at my Twitter feed, you know, Pakistan, Zindabad, you know, like wearing, you know, showing the Bosnian flags, the Afghani flags, the whole thing. We at Islam for Europeans, you know, we belong to the greater Ummah and we are willing to work with Muslims from all across the globe. But our mandate is our people. You know, just like if it's in Afghanistan, it's the Afghani people. Just like for Nigeria, it's the Nigerian Muslim people. You know, that's that's their specialty. But uh, you know, that that's what we hope, and that's why if you look at our if our you look at our YouTube channel, um, I've interviewed Pakistani brother, African American brother, um, Bosnian, you know, you name it. So again, we want to be a first class organization. We don't want to divide the Muslim community. We just feel that for you know the world in 2021. Uh, you know, it's tantamount that we give dawah to the people, the sons and daughters of Europe, and we're making progress. And inshallah, may Allah accept our humble efforts. But I, I don't, when I see a Muslim woman walking down the street, I, I you know, like, again, I, I can't even say salam to her without her getting, getting a weird look. So, and then, you know, I don't want her to feel like she's going to be attacked on the street. The best thing that we can do is grow the European Muslim sub communities from the ground up that belong part, part of the greater community. And so it become at least a visible force, um, even if for 1% of the Muslim population. So that becomes a fabric of the, of the Muslim community. Just like every other Muslim community throughout the globe, always had people that hated Islam, always had people who converted and all, all that throughout the spectrum. For any Muslim to say, you know, you know like our tribe is, all, our people have always been Muslim and you know, like there's never been any hatred, they're fooling themselves. I mean, and Europeans are no different. Uh, so this is what I pray. I pray that the Muslim community as a whole, as the, uh, you know, the, all the Muslims in the world live in p- peace and safety and security. Um, and, you know, uh, and again, that, that's my, that's my sincere wish. And that's why we have this organization. So. And by the way, I was just scrolling through, I know both of you, uh, you guys got to go. I'll just scroll through. I feel like most of the questions were covered in, um, not in the direct question format, but very throughout the conversation. Um, Omar, let me ask you this. So would you be willing to give Rob a year and reassess what Islam for Europeans is and then see like what the what progress is made? Just because like at the, at the end of the day, I don't see it what, how his mission is distracting or being um, a counter to anything you're doing, because what you're doing is great on the ground work. And that, that's what's interesting to me is that you're doing on the ground work. You're known in the community. People know you not only in St. Louis, but in Chicago when you came up here, you know, and all that. So the online stuff is like you would think is just there's so much noise in the online sphere. Right. And Rob, in the same way, I think he's like a lot of this is like, you know, we connect to people online, but then we're interacting with them via like phone, phone calls, et cetera. And in Zoom, you know, because there's not probably a lot of people for Islam for Europeans in London, Ontario, right? But you know, you you have people tuning in from like I got mess people brothers from Seattle, Minnesota, et cetera, et cetera. So I would propose that like Islam for Europeans keeps doing what they're doing. But Omar, why don't you just like sit back and watch them do what they do? If there's something that's off, then we come back and be like, all right, yo, this is what I told you about. Well, well, I'm a student of history. You know, I love history. You can follow me on Goodreads and see all the history books I'm reading. Right. But let's go back into American religious history. So in the late 19th century, there was a man at the Topeka Bible College in Topeka, Kansas, that started teaching a new theological 
interpretation of evangelical Protestantism. And that became the Pentecostal movement. And because they sent missionaries into the black community and, and to Mexico, Pentecostals quickly became a majority non-white faith. Troubled by this, white Pentecostals in St. Louis, about 25 years after that, founded the denomination known as the Assemblies of God for white Pentecostals. And what happened was white Pentecostals went on to be segregationists and hold very racial, racially reactionary politics. So Rob may be very well intentioned uh, in his desire for Islam for Europeans, but history has shown me that there is an audacity to the caucasity to found such organizations. So let's give it five years, 10 years and take a look. But I really don't think that it's needed. Well, and just to say, I think that we are, we're talking about the Jim, the Jim Crow era still, era, you know, segregation being the norm in America. Th that would be my counter to that. I don't, I'm, I'm not even going to like, uh, I don't know if Rob is anything to that. But anyways, I, I think let, let's go ahead. I, I honestly, though, I, I think this was a good dialogue. I think you guys agree on the sim. Like we definitely are agreeing that there's problems, right? But then how do we address it? There's some methodology differences, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I really do want to commend both of you guys for the work y'all do, y'all do, you, you, you do, right? And Omar, I mean, like, people always hit me up like, man, why do you guys platform this guy? He's so vulgar. How, and, and, and then they were like, I can't believe you brothers were laughing when he was, like, yeah. saying that stuff. I saw y'all got dragged in the comments. And I was like, well, it was funny. What do you want me to do, not laugh? And then you brought in uh, Abril Mesh the next episode. Daughter, you yeah, know? right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you referenced him, right? I and I asked her, him. I asked her, did you know this guy, Omar Lee? And she's like, no. Yeah. I was like, well, yeah. he, he quoted your dad in the last yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know her dad. I, I don't know. I mean, she was probably a kid when you she were was, there. She was, she, was, she, was, she was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Right. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, 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 and uh, okay. real quick, where can people find, find you uh, uh, on social media? You can subscribe to the Omar Lee newsletter okay. on Substack. You can follow me on Twitter at Umar Lee, Roman numeral three. That's Umar Lee, I, I, I. Uh, and you can also um, find me on my YouTube channel, subscribe, uh, and on Facebook. And um, I'm selective about Instagram. But if you have, um, um, you know, if you're um, pleasing, uh, you can add me on uh, Instagram. Cool. Okay. And I can be reached uh, on Twitter at Robert of Canada. Uh, there's also the YouTube channel Islam, the number four Europeans. And um, what else do I have? My Facebook is Robert Lee. Uh, no relation. Lee is my middle name. <laughs> no uh, relation to like no the Confederate relation. general? No yeah. relation to the Confederate general. Okay. I am. I am related. But yeah. You are? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes you really? Yes. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Not a, not a direct, not a direct descendant, but you know from the same lineage. Uh, we, I want to have another conversation about that because I'm like I've always been fascinated <laughs> with I've all like Robert E. Lee has always been a fascination of mine for some reason. Mm. I, I watched this movie, this movie called Gods and Generals. Yeah, that that was uh, Ted Turner behind it, I believe. Well, Robert behind Duvall it. was acted as Robert E. Lee. Yeah. Right, and he was yeah. like, you know, they asked him to lead the Union Army. He was like. Sir, Virginia is my home, and I will not raise a rebellion. I will not lead an army against Virginia. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, with that being said, appreciate you guys. Uh, you know, yep. coming on. I do want right. to give a. I want to give a shout out to two guys in the in the comments, Riley Holbrook and Samuel Master for being like on the whole thread, commenting, uh, being yeah. engaged. Um, What's up, Riley and Sam? How y'all yeah. doing? Yeah, oh, Riley and Sam. Yeah. yeah. So appreciate y'all. You know, tuning in. Um, okay. I didn't like pre advertise this. We just kind of like, um, right. you know, I, I I've been really busy these days trying to like so schedule stuff in advance hasn't really worked. So we figured we right. do the stream and go from there. With that being said, uh, right. please follow the channel. Um, if you watch it on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, like, um, and if you're listening on the audio apps, make sure you leave a five star review on the podcast apps. For my special guests Umar Lee and Robert Dufour, I'm your host Mahinda Podcaster, signing off.